Without further ado, I want to introduce our, our speaker, Professor Chrissy Colaru. Uh, is a professor of African history and African diaspora history at uh, City University of New York. Uh, he's a very well published scholar. I mean, he's very productive. I mean, gosh, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> but in addition to being a professor of uh, history, he's also a distinguished uh, CUNY fellow and has a ton of grant, a ton of fellowship, a ton of grant to his name, very prestigious grant. I alluded to his scholarly productivity earlier. I mean, he and I got uh, to our PhD the same year, but um, he has published tons of articles. Uh, let me make sure I get this right. At the last count, because it keeps changing, Every, it keeps changing every month, maybe every week. <laughs> At the last count, he has seven books, seven single author books to his name. Um, and some of these books are just field defining. Uh, I won't go through all of them, seven books. But his book, The Account Ac Ac People, a documentary history, fantastic book. Uh, works with primary sources to chart the path of the Akan people and how they dispersed and scattered from modern day Ghana to all over the Americas and the Caribbean. But perhaps the one that we the book that we all we may know more than any other is his book which was published by Oxford University Press in 2010, The Akan Diaspora in the Americas. Again, looking at this theme of the Akan ethnicity and how Akan culture and influence is spread across the Americas and the Caribbean. He has a ton of other uh, books, again, seven books in what, 12 years? My goodness. One time I had to ask him his, uh, his secret. <laughs> and uh, what he told me, I'm not going to repeat it here. I'll keep it to myself. I'm, to <laughs> I'm being selfish with it. So, uh, the secret of his scholarly productivity. He's going to. Uh, speak to her briefly, but I want to say one, one last thing about him. Uh, he's also, in addition to being an amazing scholar, a very productive scholar and teacher, he's also the director of the press. Uh, he actually publishes books. So hopefully, if any of you has a manuscript, if you're looking for a publisher, you can approach him. And he has actually a display of books published by his publishing company, publishing firm. Uh, the publishing house is called Diasporic Africa Press, and it's based out of New York. Uh, I was one of the people privileged to be published in this, uh, and, and that's my book. I knew he was going, he was going to do that, <laughs> and that's my book that is holding up there. So uh, it's a very good press. Uh, it's very, they are very good to work with. So if you have a manuscript, uh, look for it. So I'll turn it over to mm -hmm. Professor Chrissy Konadu. He has a few slides to show us in addition to his uh, talk today. Okay. So we we'll round up after this. Uh, okay. okay. Well, thank you all very much um, for being here. Obviously, you have other uh, options on a uh, afternoon. Um, so the time that we have together, what I'm going to try to do is to poke at um, this theme of Africa and the Crossroads and hopefully provide you with some substantive um, ideas, um, some provocations, reasonably, of course, um, to I think to begin to seriously um, challenge ourselves to think about Africa, and I would by extension include the world, because um, Africa is part of the world at this crossroad movement. Um, last I was here a few years ago, um, Professor uh, Landers and of course Professor Chunu had invited me here for the Atlantic Seminar, and uh, at that point I, I wasn't wearing one of these. Um, you, you can see the cost of production. <laughs> So I'm going to wear one of these um, in disguise this afternoon. And essentially, this is what I want to do. Uh, I've broken down this conversation into five parts. And I'll announce each part uh, as I go to kind of give you some markers uh, so you can follow at least my, my, my thinking as I work through these ideas. The talk is based, of course, on an intellectual biography of an indigenous healer, farmer, and blacksmith named Nana Kofi Donko. The while the talk, I'll use Nana Kofi Donko, or Kofi Donko, or Nana Donko. They're referring to the same person. 
And to keep you all uh, attentive, I want you to figure out who Kofi Donko is in the photos that are queuing in the background. I won't tell you who he is until the end, but you try to figure out who you think he is uh, in this mix of cascading photos behind me. They'll be my theme music or visual um, theme as we go throughout. So I originally had planned for you some music, some highlight music from Ghana, but for some, some reason it wasn't on my flash drive. So we'll, we'll, we'll do um, the best we can. Um, since we're all in the political season, in about, what, 28 days, you all will elect the next president. So I figured I'll start with politics, okay? So the talk is entitled, The Blacksmith Tool is Medicine, Healing Africa and Our World. And the first part is entitled, Politics and the Art of Healing. Politicians are concerned with power, more than the public they claim to serve. Healers are preoccupied with the public good. A diseased society is a collection of traumatized bodies working against each other rather than their natural self-healing capacities, what scientists now call immunotherapy. Healers aptly recognize this trauma because they see human life through community and connectedness, not individuals to be manipulated for the prize of power. Healers are incessantly against, work incessantly against these forces. Healers and those who seek power over people represent the fundamental tensions of human life. Truth be told, both manipulate, but each works with different kinds of powers and toward radically different outcomes. The politician destroys the forces, deploys the forces of deception and manipulation in order to accrue temporal power to be used against other humans and with little regard for the ruin of individuals. The healer understands that the whole human being and what constitutes a whole human community the healer therefore marshals the material, immaterial resources located in his or her ecology to restore health, repair relationships, and regenerate the self-healing capacity that fights for balance within that fundamental tension. Disequilibrium is disease, and those who seek power over people thrive in disease environments. An equally fundamental human challenge is that most humans are politicians. Yes, I said it, that means you too. With or without electoral aspiration, and very few have the inborn or cultivated temperament to be a healer. You can see why healing will never be a popular vocation. The healer fights protractively against the politician in us and the diseased societies in which they thrive, working with forces that form the bookends for the human experience, physical forces, spiritual forces. These forces are no more than variations of the thematic interplay between energy and matter. If we imagine such forces as water, our physical world would be the solid, and our spiritual world would be the gaseous form that water assumes. Ultimately, the human being and the world in which we inherited and shape is a composite of these base root forces. The healer skillfully ca ca calibrates these forces to cure individuals, but also to make whole a people. April 1980, Nana Kofi was visited by a North American doctoral student and future art historian Raymond Silverman. Some of you will know Ray Silverman. He's at the University of Michigan. Ray Silverman, then the graduate student, came to interview Nana Kofi Donko at his compound. On this visit, Silverman and his interpreter bought an alcoholic drink, which in Tree we call insa, and Nana Donko used the drink to pour libation. The libation formally introduced Silverman to the cast of spiritual forces, the healer works in collaboration and served to petition those forces to ensure the safety and success of Silverman's research. That conversation was prefaced by a requisite open libation. The libation text is rather long, but for the most part, this is the structure of the libation. First, there is a acknowledgement to the creative force of the universe, then of course, Mother Earth upon which we um, stand, for which we get our food, which some of us are eating in the back. And the spiritual forces that we cannot detect with our eyes or normal human senses, but for which exist in our world um, that we all know through the various sciences. Now what's important here is that in libation, memory is collective tissue, binding the consciousness of the living to the subconscious reality of ancestry and spirit. Libation institutionalizes memory by bringing those realities into the conscious mind and temporal world through invocation and engagement. 
That engagement is further heightened through so-called spiritual trance, where two consciousness occupy the same body, and through that body, the academic boundary between the mundane and the immaterial is obliterated, recreating a new world order. In this order of things, the world we inhabit is revealed, and the network of ideas and energies that condition our lives are engaged as agents rather than recipients of the so-called gods. Though there is much to the libation in itself, the general storyline is clear. The healer fights for protection, guidance, and success for each person and the broader community, but also against the forces of tyranny, wickedness, disgrace, misfortune, and destruction itself. And I don't call long understood that being a quote-unquote good person was important but insufficient. Simply put, negativity and the, tra and the tragedies that flow from this omnipresent force can easily ruin a quote-unquote good person. Through the healer's optic, the good person has to work actively for the guidance and protection he or she desires, and simultaneous against the ever-present forces embodied by the politician in all of us. For instance, the roads on which millions of, uh, millions of people travel is populated by astute and safe drivers. But that same, or those same roads, are filled with an equal or greater number of unsafe, intoxicated, and uninsured drivers who have a net negative effect on disciplined, sober, and fully insured ones. In metaphor, the healer promotes safe driving, but also works with the forces of probability, typically out of human control, to make driving safe for all. How? By populating that road with attentive and unimpaired drivers. In other words, the healer works on a logic similar to vaccination. If most people are protected against the common diseases, their expansive web of immunity safeguards those numerically few who are unprotected and thus dangerous to the welfare of the community. In the libation, Nana Donkor deliberately uses the words guide, guard, and protect, but only petitions for the destruction of those who harbor ill intent or the ruin of other human beings. His call to destroy is an allegory of the forces that some individuals invite into their lives and use to undermine or severely harm others. Since Nana Donko knew Silverman came from a society, meaning the United States, where his understanding of human life and all the forces underpinning it was acutely undervalued, he had to let Silverman know, quote, how clearly we go about things in our way in this part of the world. Just as he had developed a partnership with a reign of spiritual forces, Nana Donko advocated for an equitable partnership between Africans and non-Africans based squarely on good habits demonstrated by both parties. In effect, Nanadonko argued for an operational unity, rooted in conduct and equity, having experienced a force of dishonesty and exploitation at the hands of white men and fellow citizens who, who pursued white men things. When Kofi Donko spoke to Silverman and his cast of spiritual forces in the early 1980, he also spoke of the ills and socioeconomic forces operating in his community and in Africa writ large. This brings us to the second part, the healer and an anthropology of African studies. After graduating from Stanford University in 1964 with a degree in biology, Dennis Warren, who some of you might know, um, entered the Peace Corps as a science teacher situated in the Techimon Secondary School. Warren spent two years teaching science, and one of his students, Awusa Bren Pong, would become his major research assistant. While in Techimon, Warren tells us, I became highly interested in indigenous bono concepts and systems of science. To further this interest, I decided to complement my training in biology and chemistry and did three years coursework in anthropology, linguistics, and African studies at Indiana University and returned to Techimon in July 1969. By then, he had married Mary Solua, who was born in Cape Coast but whose family originated from Nigeria. Such interracial marriages were rare in the 1960s, especially for white European male anthropologists who were duly warned against going native. Nonetheless, Warren returned to Techimon where Mary lived to conduct his doctoral research. Warren completed doctoral dissertation in September 1973. His study concluded that the majority of bone disease lexemades or concepts were conceptual and defined in terms of natural rather than religious or uh, spiritual causation. This finding marked a significant shift in medical and social anthropology and thus African studies because most had thoroughly been convinced that in the final instance, everything in African society is boiled down to witchcraft. 
The baseline data for Warren study derived from 1,500 disease names arranged in a 12-level taxiomatic system expressed by, quote, one venerated healer, Kofi Donko. Warren's dissertation remained one of the most cited in the field of medical anthropology for his disease classification system, but Kofi Donko's knowledge of intellectual history is little known or credited beyond his township. In many ways, Warren's research, which became the baseline for much of his later writings on Ghana and his admirable academic career, was largely the mental map of Kofi Donko. As Warren himself explained, it became apparent that one priest, Nana Kofi Donko, possessed a knowledge of herbs and healing which surpassed all of the other professional healers. The bone of disease classification scheme, a contract that became the hallmark of Warren's scholarly career, was only made possible by what Warren called Kofi Donko's assistance as a major informant. But Kofi Donko was more than just an assistant or informant, for as Warren conceded, the largest sample of data was collected from Kofi Donko, who provided highly detailed information on 204 different diseases, which came to represent the skeleton form of the Bono Techiman disease classification system as expressed by Nana Kofi Donko. In other words, Kofi Donko didn't simply inform Warren's dissertation and subsequent work, and the course, therefore, of medical anthropology. Warren's foundational dissertation research on disease and medicine was the mental map of Kofi Donko. Now, Kofi Donko shares, thinking broadly, he shares the all too common fate of many Africans recorded as informants, assistants, and interpreters. The banal exploitation of indigenous knowledge during and after the academic coming of age of African studies in European and North American universities. Such intermediaries in the circuit of knowledge production and the inequity of it all reveal the very real power relations between academia and the place of Africa in it. It also reveals the power relations between Africa and the global arrangement dominated by the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Indeed, the academic study of Africa in any society remains a byproduct of the relations of exploitation and domination and the white slash European male founding fathers of the field whom had access to capital, belonged to the same ideological and socioeconomic circles, and taught at elite academic institutions such as this one. It is doubtful Kofi Donko was aware of the intricacies of the asymmetric power relations between Africa and the world, but experience and intuition taught him that uh, this circumstance was certainly possible. For instance, he had viewed Warren with suspicion, deep suspicion, and rebuffed Warren's attempt to use him as an informant initially. Kofi Donko's exceptional articulation of therapeutics only came from the combined suasion of Awusu Brengpong, Warren's assistant, and his father, D.K. Awusu, who happened to be the interpreter for quasi-anthropologist Evia Merriwitz. Some of you might know about her for those who study Ghana. And this came at a time when Warren's research was in deep jeopardy. Awusu Brengpong recalls this, whom I spoke to um, a number of occasions. He's still alive. I spoke to him in Ghana um, years ago. But this is what he recalls. This is Musa Brent Pong in third person. When Mike Warren declared his intentions to work on traditional medicine with me, there was a need to study with a specialist, and I could think of nobody else but Nana Kofi Donko, my own grandfather. One morning, Mike and I decided to visit Nana Kofi Donko to ask him to give us his help for the proposed enterprise. Sadly, upon our arrival, Nana Kofi Donko was not prepared to work with us. He stated categorically that he was not prepared to work with any white man because the white men are cheats. Indeed, it was a very embarrassing situation, which I tried to elude Mike from. I did not want him to know the conversation between my grandfather and me. I told Mike that he was busy and that we could come back later. That evening, I went to my father, D.K. Wusu, and told him about what happened with my grandfather at my grandfather's house. Upon hearing the news, my father laughed and said to me, I am not surprised that was the character of your grandfather who he inherited. He continued, you see, when the white man came to Techiman, this was your grandfather and his colleagues who stopped them from staying here. My father, Aja Kwajo Wusu, and my friends, the other healers, went to the bush and collected plenty of wasp in a gourd. At night when the white man was sleeping, my father and the other healers went to the white man's abode released the wasp into his room to sting him. Ajawus and the other healers felt that the white man was tricky. I was going to destroy our culture and traditions. Therefore, they did not warn him in Techiman. The white man then moved from Techiman to Wenchi, another town about um, 30 miles northwest of Techiman. My father laughed um, despairingly after his narration. At this point, Awusu Brenpong is apprehensive about hearing his father's story. 
He asked his father for advice, and DK Wusi in turn told him to accompany him next morning to Nana Kofi Donko's house. The next morning, around 8.30 a.m., Kofi Wusu continued, was at my grandfather's house with my father. At the initial customary greetings, DK Wusu went straight to the point. After Papa's appeal, Kofi Donko turned to me and asked, do you say that he is a good white man who will not cheat me? I replied, Nana, he's a good man. He taught me to touch him on secondary school, and thereafter, I have known him for a long time. After the meeting, Owusu tells us, Nana Kofi Donko agreed to meet Mike and I the following Friday, and Papa and I thanked him by shaking his hand. The following Friday, we readied ourselves with two bottles of snaps, gin, and by 9 a.m., Mike and I were at Nana Kofi Donko's house. This time, he received us with open arms. This was our first meeting. Now, over the course of three or four years, Warren referred to Awusu Brengpong as his research assistant. Awusu, but Awusu insists that he did 80% of the work, 95% of the interviews and transcripts and translations involved. Warren reportedly took all the notebooks in which Awusu wrote her transcription and translations, including hand-drawn maps. Warren had learned some of the Akan Chi language, but he was never able to complete an interview on his own. When one thinks of the sheer labors involved in surveying over 4,000 townspeople, interviewing hundreds of healers and office holders, and transcribing and translating their recollections, Awusu's claim of doing a lion's share of the work for Warren's dissertation and later career is not without merit. In 1973, while Warren was near the completion of his doctoral research, he began teaching at Ohio State, Iowa State University while Awusu Brenpong was pursuing a master's degree at the same university with Warren's recommendation, but without Warren's financial assistance. Besides anecdotes about Warren providing some shingles for Kofi Donko's house, Nana Donko also received no concrete benefits from his intellectual property. While Warren would go on to receive his doctorate on account of his single author dissertation, publish numerous articles and present papers from that research, and eventually earn academic promotion, tenure, and distinction. Unfortunately and strangely, we only get glimpses of Kofi Donko's intellectual prowess during the course of Warren and Brent Pogue's research. On the one hand, Warren wrote, Kofi Donko, an elderly priest healer, was selected as the primary informant, and in-depth interviews were conducted over several months until a model for the disease classification system was worked out. On the other hand, the original audio tapes conducted between March and June 1970 were all erased after the translations were made since the tapes were needed to collect other shrine histories. It all seems more than coincidence that Awusu had to give Warren all the notebooks from their research, that Warren erased audio tapes with his major informant, whose classification system was the traditional model, and that Indiana University, where the tapes were archived, and Warren's collection at the University of Iowa and Iowa State University had none of the notebooks. In fact, I checked the collections of all the universities, and no records were there in any of these repositories, um, particularly the notebooks which Arusa Brenpong had used. Nonetheless, the headings in Warren's publication announced Techiman Bono Disease Classification System, according to, -Kofi, according to Kofi Donko's classification of 392 specific diseases. We are seemingly left only to imagine the contours of that system in Nana Kofi Donko's intellect and healing. By default, Warren's work remains the portal through which Kofi Donko's intellectual history and therapeutic practice could be assessed. My research, however, uncovered two record books Kofi Donko kept in the 1980s, and these records situate his ideas translated in social practice. The first book contains over 2,000 patients, and that book was produced or created between 1982-1986, excuse me, 1982-1988. The second book has over 5,000 670 patients recorded between November 1982 and December 1986. Taken together, these 7,743 patients average over 1,500 a year. If we multiply this average by Kofi Donko's healing career of 60 years or more, we would, he would have diagnosed and treated over 100,000 patients. If we use the 40 patient a day metric, he would have averaged over 10,000 patients a year. Kofi Donko identified and treated over 700 illnesses as evidence in books one and two. Though we're working with incomplete and literally tattered records, these imprecise numbers more than justify Nanodonko's acclaim and legacy. Behind those numbers,
The cross-section of people served point to an ethic, an ethos of placing value in people and their full human development. Now this truncated snippet of Kofi Donko, Warren, and Bren Pong's regulation is a familiar story and a template for knowledge production in African studies. Theirs represent a circuit mediated by asymmetrics in global power relations and a feedback loop of informants, interpreters, and researchers that follow market forces and the course of those relations. Viewed from this perspective, the common bacteria of Africa's brain drain, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with or already heard about, is not simply African intellectuals taking their talents to North America and Europe, as LeBron James did to Miami and back to Cleveland, <laughs> but rather the real cancers are the very circuits of knowledge production and power, an illness Kofi Donko partly diagnosed but certainly could not cure. This is the third part now. Challenging and inverting global hegemony in a local place. Living in uncertainty was a recurrent theme in 20th century Ghana. But at the scale of towns and villages, we can best approximate both the meaning of, of national politics and e economic policies and the ebb and flow of local people's lives. In major towns like Techimon, where Nana Kofi Donko lived all of his life, which remained the crossroads between northern and southern halves of Ghana, agriculture was the most important economic activity and source of subsistence for all. However, the high cost of living and food prices, the, the great drought and forced return of over a million Ghanaians that were expelled from Nigeria, and stagnant waging led to elevated instances of malnutrition, especially among children. In this context, Nana Kofi Dung's attention to the community and corporal needs of Ghanaians went well beyond his old age and immediate surroundings to embrace citizens, strangers, migrants, local and state enterprises, and foreign reachers seeking his therapeutic knowledge and care. His location, Tetsiman, was ideal for it allowed him to obtain the best forest and savanna medicines, intellectually sharpen his healing ideas among a range of patients and therapeutic practitioners from both halves of the country, and make the case among healers to participate in some of the first health projects between indigenous African healers and quote-unquote Western specialists in Africa. That is, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a number of health projects hoping to integrate both the, my, the biomedical and indigenous systems of therapy in Africa. And Techiman was one of the earliest places in which these experiments were carried out. Fast forwarding, 1981, another visit from North America came to Nana Kofi Donko's compound. And she was struck by the apparent state of perpetual pandemonium. At around 868-69, Nana Donko and his healing practice showed no sign of slowing down. The visitor had this to say. One can arrive any given morning to the sound of wild drumming, the sight of half a dozen young priests and priestesses covered in white powder, shitty, which is a clay derived from sacred river, gyrating wildly around the compound. Occasionally, one falls unconscious, eyes roll back only to be helped back to, the, to continue dancing. Amidst this clamor, older priests demonstrate how to grind roots, bark, and leaves into medicines, and how to sacrifice and butcher goats providing food for priests and deities alike. For Kofi Donko is a teacher, initiating young trainees into the priesthood. And when we arrived at his compound, the initiates were undergoing intensive possession experience and training. As the training session in the morning continued, a more reserved crowd quietly filtered in and took orderly seats on a bench along a wall. They were outpatients. They came to Kofi Donko's weekly clinic to employ or to use his healing knowledge. Each held a small piece of wood with a number painted brightly on it an idea Kofi Donga picked up from the modern hospital. Now, the ability to adopt or adapt an effective technique or procedure without undermining the cultural platform in which Donna Kofi Donko's practice stood was precisely why he was so effective and why the hospital and by medical practitioners in general cons were constrained in understanding and holistically treating patients. In other words, patients were not simply diseased organism. Neither is Africa a diseased continent. They, the patients, had histories, aspirations, dream deferred, ancestral linkages, and a range of material and psycho-emotional conditions that weighed in one lived moment or another heavy on the individual and the community. Viewed from this perspective, Nana Kofi don't go to argue convincingly. It is always better for a patient to consult a traditional healer. We are more conversant with, than Western doctors, and it is our report with patients that leads to our success. Now, healers like Kofi Donko delivered over 70% of the health care in Techiman district. In the approximately 45,000 villages that account for three-fourths of Ghana's total population, 
we can suspect the picture in Tetsuman reflected the country at large. Doctors at the Holy Family Hospital in Tetsuman, such as the Dutch husband and wife physicians Willem and Magna Bore, had no doubt about the healer's capacity and what role they should play in Tetsuman in a national healthcare system. Willem, the husband, conceded this. The healers had the potential to help with our overwhelming caseload. I already refer patients with psychiatric diseases to Kofi Donko's place. Willem continued in a remarkable statement that should be taken very seriously. He said this, it is difficult to find convincing evidence that our, meaning biomedicine, is more effective than theirs. Take snake bite, for instance. 70% of the snake bites in this area are non-toxic. So if a patient with snake bite consults with a healer, he will always cure 70%. But we, with our anti-venom, on the other hand, can cure 75%. But that just is not convincing statistically. Overall, Willem was right. The number of patients that flow through Kofi Duncan's compound on a daily basis also supports Willem's case. In another interview in 1980, Kofi Duncan asserted this. He said, quote, my work is like that of a medical doctor, so anyone can come to me. Now, this English translation, however, deserves further attention. Nana Donko was what we call in Chi Obengfu, one with high degree of knowledge and skill within a system of spiritual practice and cultural acumen. Counterparts are rare and cross-cultural comparisons are imprecise. But if we had to pin this term Obengfu down to something familiar, that might be a doctoral degree for healers. You see, the Obengfu employs aduro rather than aduto, medicine of neutral value but whose outcome is fashioned by the intent of the user. Users of aduto target their ill intent to cause destruction or malice upon another person. The successful target of a duto develops a sickness, oyare, and becomes a diseased person, oyare fo. In some cases, a duto can transform the individual into an invalid, oyare susu, or a community into epidemic, oyare dum. Such diseased person or community seek out the hospital, oyare sabia, and a medical doctor, oyare safo. But they soon realize that neither the hospital nor the doctor can heal, though the latter might provide some relief. Patients use ayarisa, the art of holistic healing. At 70% rate, patients sought therapeutic intervention from indigenous healers like Kofi Donko. In these cases, and where doctors referred patients to Nana Donko, he was the embodiment of Obeng, this medicines of high potency, and appropriately called Obeng 4. To all who were amazed at the endurance that he had in seeing his patients. Now, I'll give you a sample here about Kofi Donko and his uh, ability um, in one sense. Among his records were um, a category of religious affiliation, meaning parents, excuse me, patients would, by their choice, indicate their religious orientation or affiliation. Out of the 682 patients who, who disclosed their religious affiliation in Kofi Donko number book one, the results are revealing. 31.2% were Roman Catholic, 16.7% were Muslim, 14.4% were Methodist, 9.5% Seventh-day Adventists, 4.7% Presbyterian, 4.5% True Church, 4.1% Pentecostal. Now there were six individuals who identify themselves as Musama, an independent African church, three as African faith church, and two as hallelujah. Similarly, in book two, for instance, the frequent female patients making numerous visits over several years were Alima and Abiba Kramo, Grace Yeboa, Ajwa Manu, and Ajwa Akuma. In this list, we see three major types of patients ordered by religious affiliation or spiritual adherence. You see, Kramo is the Akan term for Muslim, as in Abiba Kramo. Grace was a Christian name received through baptism or upon entering school, meaning when children enter school, they have to receive a Christian name. Manu, second born child, and Akoma, heart, represent the indigenous spiritual culture. Regardless of religious affiliation, rank, or ethnicity, the efficacious delivery of health with care was the hallmark of Kofi Donko's healing practice. These are also the cornerstones of full human development in Africa. Part number four, pragmatic Africa. Kofi Donko the healer stood at the unending precipice of temporal life and death. 
on the back of funerary announcement cards, he, annou he accounted for life's priorities. In Ghana, what you will find is that funerals are deeply important. Every Saturday they occur, every Saturday at, at clockwork, and everyone attends, including people who may live in the diaspora outside of Ghana. And those funerals are usually announced on the back of these cards. They're usually four by four, and these cards will have the person's names, the deceased, who are the bereaved. And so on the back of one of these cards, which I found in Kofi Donko's papers, this is what he had for a typical day of work. On a typical day, he and his family worked from morning to evening, earned 530 CDs, the currency of Ghana, that day. He gave the majority of the daily earnings to his wife, Afia Munafia. He bought pito, an alcoholic beverage brewed from fermented corn, to share with his family and friends, and he saved the rest. This was a typical day for him that he wrote in the back of a card or, or through a scribe. Now, though profound in his understanding of disease and medicine, Kofi Dunk was deeply pragmatic and engaged community affairs and in much of the mundane activities as other Ghanaians, such as the weekly lotto that was brought into um, the country in the late 1960s. And I actually have scraps of lotto cards that he used to play. <laughs> he didn't win, but he had a few <laughs> lotto tickets in his papers. Now, all this mattered in a community and country where government served foreign interests and ideologies rather than the non-elite public body. In fact, the government's care for the poor through its community health insurance plan was duly criticized for inability to improve health care among the impoverished, but more so for its inability to address inadequately the politics and, quote, ethnic clashes that erupted in northern Ghana. The subplot to these clashes were, on one hand, the cumulative effect of military and civilian rule, inflation, currency devaluation, failed structural adjustment schemes, and indebtedness. Now, following the 1992 elections, the country's inequalities and antagonisms ran beneath the veneer of democratic progress. That is, the model colony was now a model democracy, at least folks outside of Ghana. In the 1994, quote, ethnic rivalries over land and political authority that exploded it in the bloodiest conflict of its kind in the history of the nation, amidst Ghana's almost unquestioned acceptance of things foreign, and an attendant view of the United States as, quote, God's country. This is a view that's very popular in the country. In February 94, some 500 people were killed in the conflict that gripped northern Ghana with thousands of refugees fleeing to Togo, which is a neighbor um, to the east. The reinstalled Rawlings regime, as a regime under Jerry Rawlings, imposed an extended state of emergency and dispatched the National Guard to the area. After several people were killed in the regional capital of Tamale, negotiations began but were marred by claims of plots to overthrow the government and by opposition parties withdrawing from the reconciliation process. By August, a peace agreement was reached and a ceasefire went into effect, allowing a negotiating team to broker stability. Ironically, the new president and constitution returned to old tactics of arresting individuals who allegedly conspired to overthrow the government and charged them with crimes against the state. Further arrests and killings in the region were, were not resolved as the tensions played out further. Rather, they increased the suspicion and conflict among the participants involved and toward the new government. Kofi Donko, however, had traveled to northern Ghana, learned from its healers, and many of his patients who traveled from the region to Techiman to seek out his therapeutic offering. Kofi Donko's approach to the people of Ghana was simple. Treat all, regardless of political or religious standing and affiliation, with an affirmation of their humanity and with care. The Rawlings regime and, Af and peoples of Africa could have benefited greatly from such a pragmatic and deeply human approach. After Kofi Dunko passed 1995, several prominent healers, including Kin, made this transition as well. Their lives and countless others represent the elongated people's history of a culture, community, and continent. On the one hand, that history can only anticipate the next harvest of community-minded and culture-bound people who will embody the foundational values exemplified by Kofi Dunko. On the other hand, harvests are unpredictable in their yield, and the results are always weighed against the investments in effort and expectation. But memory connects that history to each harvest, originating in a cumulative and deeply interactive process between the unborn, the temporally living, and the deceased. Memory is the umbilical cord that links these personnel across historical time and human conceptualization of the, of the terrestrial and the celestial. That umbilical cord ensures that those actors exist simultaneously every here and now 
just as night melts cyclically into day and water takes on gaseous and solid forms. In other words, the past, present, and future become semantic nonsense. Therefore, those living in a specific historical moment always have access to those actors who assumed bodily form or spiritual form in their full and equally cyclical circle of the human experience. Viewed from an Akan perspective, each harvest is an opportunity to embody ethical ideals in existence, abrabu, to realize one's purpose in life, shibia, and to strengthen the bonds of community in flesh and in the spirit. A person's shibia, or, or, or mission in life, purpose in life, is realized as abrabo, ethical existence, in the world in which we live. This existence is both personal and communal, whereas the actual living of one's existential purpose is individuated, though the community must safeguard its content. Now, when disorder is produced by unethical existence, rituals are deployed for cyclical and cosmic balance, and for the restoration of ethical existence through community participation. Abrabo is thus malleable. It does not inherently point to justice or harmony, etc. Abrabo places the onus of ethical existence on the person in his or her community to steer them towards ethical ideal, precisely because there is no prearranged outcome. This is the challenge of human existence. This fundamental challenge is exactly why, De Kahn would argue, those who embody that ideal models it for others through community relationships in a temporal world in which we all live and guide countless others in their spiritual existence. For many, Kofi Donko remains a pillar in the community, one who was very passionate about his patients and very patient and humble himself, and a human being highly respected by the people, his patients, and his family. The memory of his ethical existence fights against the cancer of forgetting and makes his story of commitment to community and culture a model for his continent and the world we share. Final part, and thank you all for working through this. Closing thoughts. And I, I'll, I'll begin here in 1948, and in the moment it hopefully becomes clear why. In 1948, the existing world order began to collapse from the perspective of some and reconfigure for others. Arguably, 1948 was a watershed moment in the history of the, quote, modern world in terms of oscillating forces pushing toward and against empire and global hegemony as experienced, of course, by those on the ground. Unlike the Big Bang Theory published that year, the crucial events of 1948 did not emerge from a single explosive moment ushering in a new order. Rather, decolonization, nationalist agitation, the building of Western Europe, rebuilding Western Europe, and the United States of the leader of the capitalist world via the Marshall Plan, the creation of Israel and North and South Korea, the legalization of apartheid in South Africa, and the UN Declaration of Human Rights signaling a patchwork of a world. Capturing all these, all these thematic currents were the 1948 riots in the colonial capital of Accra, Ghana. In February 1948, a group of ex-servicemen, unarmed ex-servicemen in Accra, marched peacefully toward the colonial seat of government to petition the governor for outstanding pension, which the government had not paid them. The British colonial police, however, fired on the group, killing three of the ex-servicemen. News of the killings sparked rioting and looting throughout the capital. And soon participants across the colony embraced the riots as a way to express their grievances about unemployment, inflation, and the high price of imported European goods. The colonial authorities, however, suppressed the riots, appointed a commission led by Aiken Watson to investigate the unrest, and swiftly arrested nationalist leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah. Though the Watson report led, led the way for some constitutional reforms, Nkrumah transformed the sentiments of the unrest into a nationalist movement that, that led to political independence in 1957, and asserted Africa's of the Africans' right to self-governments. Though political independence was won, the fervor that produced it also produced an ill-equipped sovereign government that could diagnose an ailment called, which Nkrumah called neocolonialism, but could not heal the colonized psyche or the behaviors of an independent Ghana. You see, the desire for British imported goods, notions of beauty and civilization, was not lost upon the rioters, many of whom looted shops owned by foreign merchants because they wanted the goods and what they symbolically represented but could not afford them. Nkrumah had occupied the political machine of the state but paid insufficient attention to the accumulated colonial disturbance of his people's consciousness shaped by colonialism's protracted violence, traumas, and gutting of identity reaffirming cultural understanding. On this crucial of missed opportunity of nationalist and independence movement, 
1948 Watson report was almost prophetic. This is what the report noted on that count. Save among the older population, there's an unconfessed desire for Europeanization, at least in many respects. We say unconfessed because, while undoubtedly growing, it is not yet strong enough to cast off the shackles of tribalism. But the hands of the clock cannot be put back. The movement is gaining momentum, even if cloaked at times by anti-racial expressions. We doubt if it is sufficiently realized what problems these changes entail. Native authority, in its widest sense, is diminishing. The old religions are being undermined by modern conceptions. Earlier disciplines are weakening. Others must be devised to take their place. This is what the report concluded. By old religions and early disciplines, the commission meant the foundational ideas and life-sustaining cultural practices integral to, to social order and community life. These pillars of stability and community were systematically, quote, undermined by modern read European conceptions. Though Kofi Dongo's Techiman was a, had a rich history of an immune-like defense against such undermining intrusions, whether it was a community-wide uh, re revolt against evangelist Samuel Lepong in the 1940s or its rejection of a subordinate position in the Fanti Confederacy, Techiman was not Ghana. In other words, one was not a shorthand for the other. Techiman's physical and ideological distance from the coastal forces of transatlantic slaving, overseas empire, British colonialism, and Europeanization made it a frontier rather than a frontal harbinger of things to come. What was remarkable about Techiman is that, on the one hand, its people's experience the infiltration of Christian and Islamic missions like the rest of the colony. On the other hand, the community never became Islamic nor Christian, but it allowed both religions to coexist in a subordinate position with an indigenous, homegrown spiritual culture and humanistic values. At least that was the case, more or less, when Kofi Donko was alive. Even more remarkable, if not deeply ironic, is that the force of latent empire, colonialism, and Europeanization unleashed upon the new nation as compared to pockets in the colony by the very anti-colonial figure and government Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah proclaimed to build a new nation on indigenous values, but sought to destroy those indigenous institutions underwritten by those values such as chieftaincy. Nkrumah led an anti-colonial movement of, for political independence, but ended up using rather than replacing the colonial instruments of the state and the central government in draconian ways. When Nkrumah inaugurated the new nation and a new national identity as, quote, Ghanaians, both nationalizing efforts had no protection to specific cultural identities nor the fabric of indigenous cultures, making them acutely vulnerable to the predation of missionary institutions whose mode of proselytization were the four central pillars of human life, spirituality, religion, education, health care, and language. Soon, mission schools rather than elders educated the young. Bibles and hymn books were translated into indigenous languages. Dictionaries were created. Clinics and hospitals preached the gospel to patients. And churches brought these strands together as the only place to worship, quote, God and his son in the phenotypical image of a European male. When Nkrumah proclaimed the people of Ghana were, quote, no longer colonial, but a free independent people, he indicated Ghana's independence was impossible without the support of God and God's blessing. One of the most underexposed ironies of the nationalist moment in 20th century Africa is how anti-colonialist statesmen thoroughly schooled in mission settings allowed, even promoted, colonial missionary ideologies and assaults in indigenous cultures while they claim to value things, quote, traditional. In that moment, however, we saw the establishment of Healers Association led by Kofi Donko and others. In response to those assaults, the association protected indigenous culture from the multi-tiered missions, multi missions that received state and local protection from the central government and local office holders who saw the mission's opportunity to enhance their standing as modern. The legacy of Kofi Dunkel's resistance movement and Nkrumah's missed opportunity at real decolonization has been baked into 1992 Ghanaian constitution. In it, individuals are guaranteed, quote, freedom to practice any religion and to manifest such practice, but customary practices which dehumanize or are injurious to the physical and mental well-being of a person are prohibited. There's nothing in the Constitution, therefore, that prohibits the dehumanization and injurious mental assault Christians carry out against customary read indigenous practitioners. The myth of religious freedom in Ghana 
is of the same kind and quality as the United States. And this shouldn't surprise us because the 1992 Ghanaian Constitution was modeled after the U.S. Constitution. Since the 16th century global expansion of the European presence, the Iberian leaders of that expansion, motivated by an unfinished Christian crusade, built their colonial outposts and towns with a church in the center. Other Europeans followed their overseas model for creating communities built around slaving, race, and the Christian religion. Projecting from the church outward to the town's frontiers were the combined ideologies of race, religion, and slaving that structured colonial society and created the platform for global empires. In the Gold Coast, Ghana, the expanse of localized polities and empires centered also on settlements ranging from modest villages to large towns, but settlements, regardless of size, built around spiritual forces and the close-knit temporal spiritual understanding that formed the infrastructure for community. Emanating from those spiritual resources were thus transcendent values, ideologies of community bonds and cultural codes that in their form foundational forms balanced male-female leadership, valid community over self-interest, and offered an internalized law and order. Have you ever wondered why there were no prisons, former policing force, or standing professional army observed in most of the travel accounts for 15th to 9th century Africa? It is no more essentialist for scholars to dig up Abraham Lincoln, Greek democracy, or the legacy of the Roman Empire and prefer their meaning for our times than it is for us to do the same for African ideas, institutions, and spiritual culture to heal our wounds in our world. Thank you. for this fascinating and unique insight into the intersection of medical anthropology, traditional medicine, and the history of Ghana. I would like to highlight two aspects of your presentation in hopes that we can generate some discussion amongst the audience. So the first is the role of traditional healers in Africa. Healers play multiple roles in developing and maintaining the social fabric of African society. One commonly cited statistic is that 80% of people living in Sub-Saharan Africa will visit a traditional healer at some point in their life. Hidden behind this fairly staggering percentage is the complexity behind who a healer is, the role they play in generating explanatory models of disease causation, as well as the broader role they play in establishing social norms and cultural values. There are always a large number of healers in any given community. Most are honest, hardworking people who get paid very little for their efforts. In one province in Mozambique, where I work, there are 25,000 healers registered with the Ministry of Health for about 4.4 million people. Few of them can read or write, which is a characteristic that's very highly valued, and yet they are trusted with the most intimate problems and symptoms that a person can ever experience. Interestingly, as we were just discussing, now healers are partnering with biomedical health systems at a fairly high rate across the continent. How will their own health systems change? What elements from Western medicine will they adopt? One thing that they were just talking about here is creating a waiting list. That's a possibility. But what if healers adopt something that becomes unsafe? In many parts of Southern Africa, healers use razors to create injections. That's the blood exposure that the healers are getting from patients, and patients are often getting exposed to razors that are used on multiple patients. And that's, that's very disconcerting. So what's the responsibility to them and their patients as practices change due to Western influence? The second item that I believe needs further discussion is exploitation, specifically the theft of intellectual property that has routinely recurred from informants and research assistants living in low and middle income countries by anthropologists and other researchers. Healers across Africa are very hesitant to work with Western researchers or even others within their own culture who are not healers for fear that they will steal the strategies for diagnosis and treatment. In part, this is an economic decision. Those who want to become a healer pay a pretty significant tuition for their training. The other aspect is a question of honor and pride and just this is their own intellectual um, copyright, really. They have developed these treatments along with the ancestors and other healers, and why should someone else be given this information? In particular, a person that doesn't really even understand or believe in what they're doing. There are two types of theft from the research assistant. 
for that in quotes. Probably the greatest is intellectual theft. But what kind of economic compensation should be given to this person? At the minimum, it seems partnership means both joint publishing and credit, as well as uh, economic support. But what else is necessary? Lastly, I would like to thank Dr. Kanadi for highlighting the complexity of culture, human behavior, and social change. What was most clear in his presentation is that motivations guiding and incentivizing human behavior are often in conflict with the moral or correct thing to do, leading all people, whether they be healers, anthropologists, or politicians, to make decisions that can neg negatively, negatively impact others around them. Perhaps we should think more about how we can act like this ideal healer, concerned with our impact on the health and well-being of the entire community before we act. Thank you. By efficacy, do you mean, for instance, does ABC plant medicines have the outcome claimed by the healer? Or do you, okay. Yes, actually, uh, I, I was, incidentally, I, I was asked to go to um, both the University of Iowa and Iowa State where, where Mike Warren's papers have been, have been lodged courtesy of his, his um, former wife who you might have seen her on, on this, um, one of these images, and, and the daughter. I was, at, I was invited to come and look through the papers and basically document what could be of value to scholars, uh, give my work in, in the region. And so I, I thoroughly went through everything they deposited there. Can't be sure that they kept things for themselves, but whatever they deposited, I went through. And in doing so, I did see that, in fact, Mike Warren had um, supplied um, dried samples of various plant medicines, barks, roots, um, even dried leaves, to have a, um, I think is a phytogenetic analysis, um, to determine if some of the properties, you know, in, in these plant medicine have the kind of outcome or effect as claimed by the healer. Um, as you know, that's a very expensive process. <laughs> um, that's why pharmaceuticals spend billions of dollars on developing one drug. <laughs> and many don't in, in invest because of the, the high cost. And so what I saw in his records, um, non unpublished records, was that he had made the attempt, um, but the, the, I think the cost or perhaps the unwillingness of the um, agencies that would do that kind of research wasn't forthcoming. So I saw him, I saw his correspondences with um, actually um, medical doctors who do this kind of analysis, but there wasn't any records about the outcome uh, of their survey. Um, so it's hard to tell. Now, uh, what is clear is this, in terms of um, what's, what's being called biopiracy. <laughs> uh, what is clear is this, is that um, the claims made by healers are in fact, in fact um, substantiated by some of this research. So for example, and this kind of gives you the collateral damage, so there's this entire forest in Cameroon that was decimated by a French pharmaceutical company, and this is recent history, uh, in order to make that drug Viagra so some men could have a longer pleasure. Entire forest, which means the animals that rely on it, the wildlife, the people whose lives, the entire, destroyed, not replanted, but entire destroyed, so some men in this country and other parts of Europe can have a longer erection. Um, and that claim is based upon what they, companies have gathered from the healer's work. 
And so I think more often than not is, is that, uh, not all, certainly, but as um, noted a moment ago, a number of these claims that are made based upon empirical research over centuries passed down and actually tested, that many of these substantial claims, whether it is um, botanicals used for makeup or used for um, certain psychosomatic um, traumas, or even bodily traumas, they, they have been brought over into the biomedical world and commodified and commercialized uh, as, as, as drugs. Um, so I know that, that go, goes on, I think, quite, um, quite rapidly. Now, he, here is one last thing I'll say on that note that I, I want you all to be very clear-minded about. Plant medicines all have toxicity. And so what I found in, in doing the research uh, for this in the previous book on medicine is that most of the plants that were most efficacious used in Techiman District were all poisonous plants. Now, it might may shock you, and it should, but I want, to, I want to tell you the other side of the poison, that poison is a relative term <laughs> in the sense that healers do not take their plants into a laboratory and try to dissect each particular protein or each part that has this effect or, or, or this particular strand. They, 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 they use the, uh, the toxicity at a certain level to be able to, again, kill um, this um, act as an as a, as a, as a antiviral, antibacterial to whatever is going on, disease in the body. And so the point is, what I found surprising that oddly, most of the, most, most of the efficacious plants were actually poisons. <laughs> but poisons only when used in what? A dose that was not safe for human consumption. Uh, and so that, that's the irony of these plant medicines, that all of them have toxicity, um, dangerous toxicity. But the combinations, many healers would use a bark and a leaf, uh, with um, peppers, uh, with ginger. Um, so they were used in combination. And of course, in combination, their chemical composition, of course, changes into a new kind of medicine that on its own would not have the same effect. And so th there's a whole range and, ty and typologies that are used by healers um, in terms of plant medicine that is much more complicated than his question justifies. Yes. But um, sildenafil, I can't pronounce it, sildenafil, that is Viagra. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it was a chemical compound that was uh, synthesized by British chemists in Kent, England a number of years ago. It has nothing to do with biological products and it was never derived from any plant product. So mm -hmm. I think your information on the devastation of Cameroon forests, which may be completely accurate, probably has nothing to do with this particular drug. Mm -hmm. Well, just, just sure, well, well I, I can get you the, the information. Now, of course, it, it may be a Viagra-like drug, it may not be Viagra, but I, I do know that the French pharmaceutical had developed this Viagra-like drug from the Cameroonian forests. Uh, as you know, there are generics, there are other kinds that may go in a different name. So, it may not be the brand Viagra, but it's a Viagra light drug. So, uh, yes, you can choose. Thank you for a wonderful paper. Uh, I, I don't want to take this off track, but I noticed in several of the photographs there are drums. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk uh, at all about the role of mm -hmm. dance or drama in doing rituals. Sure, I indeed. Um, the drumming, of course, is crucial um, in Africa and in the diaspora, as, as we know very well. Um, but in, in this context of Kofi Donko's work, um, as part of the paper I tried to share with you secondhand, um, the state of perpetual pandemonium observed by one, one foreigner uh, was just that. Was, was when, whenever you have, essentially, whenever you have, is a formula, but may make it simple. Whenever you have uh, instrumentation, drumming, uh, movement, dance, and song, these, this is the recipe for a um, transcendent uh, spiritual awakening. And this form that can be observed, for example, in Baptist churches here in, in the South, uh, can be observed in um, Candomblé, uh, Lukumi, and different kinds of ritual, whether it's Brazil or varieties in Cuba or Puerto Rico um, or in Haiti. 
whenever you have these three instances, and so because he's a healer, that at times will go into spiritual possession um, or it's called, called trance. The drums are a medium to, to help the person get there, but here's something that is little known. Kofi Donko was a Busumfo, and Busumfo are people that don't need the drum. The Okomfo are the people that dance, and, and by, again, they, they spin in cotton clockwise fashion. These are the people that dance and, and move. Um, they need the drum to, to be induced into that state. Kofi Donko doesn't need the drum. As Busumfo, what he does is th there's a, a brass pan called Yawa, and in it, it is a range of medicines that essentially is the cell phone to connect between he and, and this particular spiritual force that he is custodian for. And that yawa has a pad uh, called kashire, and that pad goes on top of the head, and the yawa goes on top. And in that state, there is no drumming. There's one thing, invocation. There's a ochaimi, the person who is the uh, invoker. And a chaimi will say something like this, esu, esu, a prayer song, and, and, and just words in silence. And soon what happens is this, the body begins to shake because there's that second consciousness coming inside the body. And essentially, this is how it, how it feels. Um, you, it's like watching TV, but you're watching yourself on TV. So you go to the background, and you, you're seeing what's happening, but your senses are in the background. But all, what's used to get you to that place, that state, is not the drums or any music, not even the cowbells. It simply does the words. And it's beautiful to see because you would think in most of the ritual contexts in Africa and the diaspora, there's always a drum, right? But in this case, there isn't. It's just words. And, and, so, the, and so the conscious comes in, hits the, hits the foot, comes back up, and they tap the pan to acknowledge that it's run the full circuit. And the person usually eyes are closed. They greet everyone. It's a ritual that they go through. But the point is that when you would think the drum will be the major inducement to get to that state, in fact, in the, case of, in the case of healers like Kofi Donko, who were busufo, uh, rather than a komfo that dances around and get this kind of trance-like state, it, it's the opposite. <laughs> you know? and I, I'm fascinated by that, how, how that works. Because it reminds me of, in, in, in a bigger sense, how we think about African spirituality the way we think about other people's spirituality. For instance, if, and I'm being general here and slightly stereotypical, but it's true. For instance, if a Chinese person goes to the gravesite of their ancestor and puts down food and says a prayer, that's cultured, that's high culture, as we see dramatized in the film Crouching Tiger or Hidden Dragon. Um, but if an African does that, it's voodoo. <laughs> same exact thing for the same purposes, right? Uh, because we, we tend to think of, you know, in, in these caricatures, not say we are, but certainly in a broader society. And so my counterpoint by, by, sh by sharing with you that there is a very deeply, you know, spiritual and, and just really beautiful, just words. Mm -hmm. Are the words written aside? Are they spoken in a regular way? They're proverbial. Yeah, they're proverbial. All proverbs. In fact, it's, it's the kind of tree, which is the Akan language spoken in Ghana, that you have to be trained to know how. Maybe if I said those words to an ordinary person in Ghana, they wouldn't know what it means. Um, think of it this way. It, it's, 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 there's, there's, a, there's talk on the streets, and there's talk in the academy. It, it's that kind of difference. And so um, it's, it's deeply proverbial. Uh, for example, they will use the old tree. They'll say bonsa. Bonsa is a contraction between insa, jin, that you pour for libation, and bon is referring to brofo or bono, which, which is brofo, which is referring to foreign, European. So basically, you have foreign drink, right? And so you have to be trained in terms of the language of the, um, the spiritual force. It's called abusum. But it's deep, it is it's rhythmic, but it's proverbial. So it, it's more so like, like an extended praise poem. If you like, I can share a piece with you quickly. Hmm? Okay, quickly, folks, and I can get to your, your wonderful questions. Uh, here's a drum poem that goes back at least 300 years, and it begins like this. Esu tano. A kwain su, a su tra kwain openi wine. A kwain tra su, a su tra kwain openi wine. The path crosses the river, the river crosses the path. Which came first? Ye bo kwain yi koto su no. We created a path to encounter the river, which means the river came first, and we created the path to get to it. Asu brekete. 
krong krong tano, brefia tano, asu brekete, ajo krantiye, asante kuto kwenye busu, asu brempom, abrempom da asu bre, kuko bebia eke kama wati, mede brebe, mede brebe, masita, mede brebe, mede brebe, masita, tako fri brempom, fri brempom demrifa, demrifa demrifa, asu brempom, and you can tell. You can play this out on the atumpine uh, drum that's used for drum language, but it, it's 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 the series of proverbial statements out to be layered out to the other. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. All right. So you can play out what I said on the drum. And you can hear asu brimpong, dun dun dun, high low, high low, mid mid. Indeed. So what are some of the sure, sure. Uh, sure. Um, indeed. In fact, uh, a good friend of mine is Donna Quake, who said she lives in Florida. Uh, I live in New York, by the way, and so um, I'm very jealous of him. At the moment, I'll show you why I'm jealous of him. Because he's in Miami, and Miami's part of that tropical you know, basin. Um, he actually can find a lot of the plants that occur in Ghana, whereas I can in New York in a temperate environment, cold place, by the way. Uh, but there are some common plants, for example, if, if, if you or your family may um, come from Jamaica, um, is a, oh, the Caribbean Basin, um, there's a plant that's sold in dry form in the, Asian, in the grocers, um, in, in major cities, I'm sure Nashville may have one. There's a plant referred to in tree as Nina, but Nina is also called Circe. And Circe is, is a bitter plant used in the Caribbean widely, in the English-speaking Caribbean widely. I'm sure it may be also in the, in the Spanish-speaking Caribbean as well. Um, yeah, I, I can show it to you if we go to the store. Uh, but Nina is, is used for a range of purposes. Um, Susu is another plant um, that, that, that's, that's used in Ghana and in the diaspora. A plant that's not used for medicinal purposes, but that, that's in Jamaica, is Aki. Aki comes from Achi, which is, found, which is found in Ghana. But in Ghana, they don't use it. It just falls on the ground and the birds eat it. You know? But in Jamaica, it's, it's part of a national dish. You know? Uh, and there's a range of foods. In fact, I'm working on um, another project about diet and disease um, between the Gold Coast and uh, British English-speaking Caribbean. Uh, and there's a range of, of food, dokono, which is, which is the fermented cassava, actually sweetened cassava, wrapped in a banana leaf. You know, my folks in, in Jamaica, they still make it. They make it in Ghana, too. So I think along the lines of, of medicinal herb is also food waste, right? culinary cuisines that are created, um, and a range of them, you know, just corn-based, other kinds of foods that were, in fact, um, part of the transit. And, and backwards, too, because in the 1850s, a number of missionaries from Jamaica and Barbados were brought back to the Gold Coast, Ghana, and they introduced mango, allspice, which is, a, you know, pimento, <laughs> uh, and a range of other culinary items, you know, so you have this a circuit, you know, um, between them. You all have been very quiet. A few of you are still falling asleep. I don't take offense, though, because actually, because you're sleeping, it means everything I say goes directly into your head. No, no fight. <laughs> yes, my friend. Uh, hi, thank you for coming very much. Thank you. Uh, my question is just around healers and how they approach. I think you might have touched on this a bit. How they approach non bodily health issues, so especially probably mental health, mm -hmm. and kind of the role that they have in that. Uh, maybe even more broadly, how uh, how Ghanaian people can they, are, are are they changing in the way that the United States is changing and mm -hmm. are thinking about mental health and mm -hmm. destigmatization and things mm -hmm. like that? Right, that's an excellent two-part question. The first part about uh, approaches to mental health, which is very big. In fact, um, there might have been a, a poking towards that in, in, in the paper. You were one of the people that was sleeping, so I, I saw you. Uh, so you might have missed that part, but it's okay. I don't take it personally. Um, but to your first part of your question, there was an acknowledgement from the European doctors who worked in the Holy Family Hospital in Techiman, 
whereas they said, look, they would outsource the psychosomatic, right, the mental health challenges to Kovidonko, and Kovidonko, on his part, said, look, we understand it better because we have a rapport, meaning that I use my, my own mother a, as an example. Um, my mother came to this country, and she um, came to New York, Brooklyn, New York in particular, and um, after a few years, she was never the same. And um, my mother, actually, um, she um, um, did succumb to uh, one of these depressions, but it was seasonal. And the link was with the environment and the, and the coldness. She came from a tropical place, and so she, could, she couldn't, I think her, her nervous system and, and her circuitry was so built right with light and, 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 and having the sun and being warm by it. And to have essentially grayness and gloom, if they go to London, for example, in November, gray all over, it's depressing. Uh, and I'll give you a second example to make this point home. I went to graduate school at Cornell, Ithaca, and we didn't see the sun for six months. But guess what? Cornell has an equally high rate of suicide among, among students who jump off the gorge. It's a beautiful place in the summer. <laughs> who jump off the gorge because the, the environment is so melancholy and so gloomy that and, and you have the pressures that people have you know, to do well, extremely well, from their families. And so between Cornell and my mother's state, I can see how environment plays a, a deep role, not the sole role, but in understanding the psychosomatic condition and also kin. Many people paid Kofi Donko with chickens and eggs. You know, it was in-kind gifts. It wasn't monetary. And so you'd be surprised how much healing occurred just by having you know, care delivered to you and also knowing that people affectionately care about you and, and, and do it with a certain kind of humanity, how, how that goes into making people recover. Because oftentimes, not all the time, and I'm not a therapist or psychologist here, but oftentimes this disconnect between the world in your head and the world that we live in, it, it kind of comes back together when, when you feel connected to community. So what I'm suggesting is that community has a major role as therapy for people who feel disconnected between what's happening in their heads and what's happening on the ground. And I think that was one of the hallmarks of Kobe when he said, we have a rapport with the people. We know their histories. We know their families. We know their lifestyles. We know the disease history in their family, who is predisposed to what. And that goes a long way into therapy. You know? The other part of your question um, that I think is you know, e equally important, that these matters of, of you know, um, mental um, health and, and, and the, pl the role that healers may or may not have in them um, is something where I think Kofi Donko, um, for all what he does well and all of his flaws, they, they provide really um, a very clear case over a period of time. I couldn't do it here, but in the book that's coming out on him, I start in the 19th century, and I start with his earlier family. And his family is filled with healers. In fact, his sister was a healer. Uh, his mother was a healer. Uh, his brothers were healers. His children were healers. And this was a multi-generational. His grandfather, uh, who I mentioned here, Kwajo Usu, was a healer. And so being in that environment, he wasn't seduced by the uh, Christian orthodoxy or the capitalism that was r ravaging the coast of Ghana in the 19th century. He was you know, tucked into this family that was really focused on the value of kin and community, the value of, of therapy broadly applied, and also the value of um, not just focusing on individual health, but focusing on community health. Because if the community is healthy, individuals can be taken care of, rather than the other way around. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you. All.